The argument in this video requires a proof that makes use of all four of the bottom-up things that we've been focusing on recently. We have introduced three box rules, arrow in, tilde in, tilde out, and we've introduced a strategy that I call two lines for ampersand. A strategy isn't a rule, so it never gets mentioned in doing the proof. A strategy is just a process that we go through on a regular basis, and so I think it's nice to give it a name. What I've really wanted to emphasize is that for all four of these things, they are dictating instructions to us based on a main connective at the bottom of the proof. Well, let's jump in and begin this proof. Let me get my pencil. There we go. Okay, as we know, we always start at the top and do the obvious things. And line 1 has an ampersand as a main connective, so the obvious thing is to break it up. So we get Z and tilde W ampersand T. One ampersand out, done twice. Check it off. Line 2 also has an ampersand as its main connective. Well, isn't this exciting? So we get to break that up as well and get D and T, and that's two ampersand out. Done twice. Yep, that was a bunch of boring stuff up there. Is there anything else we can do? Well, three, five, and six are completely uninteresting. What about line four? The tilde is the main connective on line four, and I like to say at this point in the semester, the tilde is like a lock on the parentheses. You can never get the stuff that's in there outside of there. You cannot break this up. I've also pointed out that when you see a line like this, there's a very good chance that it will end up playing a role in a contradiction. Because since this is a lock on the parentheses, one of the very few ways to make use of a line like this is as half of a contradiction. So we might make that mental note but the important thing is to recognize that we are now stuck at the top. Since we're stuck at the top, it's time to go to the bottom. And the first thing we do when we go to the bottom is identify the main connective. Pretty obviously, it's the ampersand. Sometimes people make the mistake and think it's this tilde up in front. But the tilde can only be the main connective when it's the only thing that's outside parentheses. The ampersand is outside parentheses, so clearly it's the main connective. Now, the important thing is that the main connective tells us which of these four things to do. It's not an arrow. It's not a tilde. It's not nothing. It's an ampersand. So that means do two lines for ampersand. And we know what that means. In the middle of the proof, we are going to put P, tilde, Z, arrow, W. At the bottom of the proof, we are going to write tilde G, arrow, D. What we're doing is breaking this up into two separate proofs. We've got one proof, we've got space to do a proof for tilde Z, arrow, W, and then we've got space to do a proof for tilde G, arrow, D. What's really important here is that you deal with the parentheses correctly. When you look at tilde Z arrow W, everything in front of the ampersand, what's its main connective? It's a tilde in front of the ampersand. That's why when we write tilde Z arrow W, these parentheses are essential because we need to show that the tilde is the main connective. But when you look at tilde G arrow D, the arrow is the main connective on this side, and that's why we want to drop the outer parentheses here. Whenever parentheses would encompass the entire line, that's when you get rid of them. The bottom line is that this formula has a tilde as its main connective. This formula has an arrow as its main connective. We have completed two lines for ampersand. When you do two lines for ampersand, there's no boxes involved with this process. It's just breaking up the conclusion. Now, we look at each of these two things in turn and we attempt to prove them. Okay, so tilde Z arrow W. What's its main connective? Well, we've just said it's a tilde. 
Which of these four things deals with tilde as main connective? Obviously, that's got to be tilde in. In fact, this whole formula just is tilde p. So, it's a box rule. We need to make a box up above it. We put this box like this. Nice four-sided box that occupies the entire available space. The first line is line 7 and it's going to be a PA for the rule tilde in. And what goes at the top of this box? Well, if this formula is tilde P, P itself is Z arrow W. We're trying to show that Z arrow W is false. We're going to pretend it's true. What goes at the bottom of the box? Well, obviously, it's the upside down capital T, which is the contradiction symbol. What is a contradiction? In logic, we know that it's a formula of the form P ampersand tilde P. This is a logical disaster. It's like saying polar bears are fuzzy and also polar bears are not fuzzy. It's any two sentences, one that says something positive and one that says the absolute opposite and that's just nonsense. So we're going to show you that if Z arrow W was true that would result in nonsense. Therefore Z arrow W can't be true. Okay, every time you set up a box you go back to the top and you see what you can do. Well, 3 is still uninteresting. Line 4, still a lock on the parentheses. 5 and 6, can't work on those. 7. Ah, if we had Z, then we could get W. And there's a Z on line 3. So yes, that's where we need to work. W by 3, 7, arrow L. Great news. Okay, now that we have W, is there anything else we can do? Well, we can check off line 7. Our attention might once again go to line 4. And notice we are trying to build a contradiction. We have mentioned that lines like this oftentimes play a role in a contradiction. And so what you're wanting to do is to notice, hey, if we were going to have a contradiction, we'd have to have something negated. Tilde W ampersand T, I can think of that as the tilde P part of my contradiction. If this was tilde P, P itself would have to be W ampersand T. So I'm looking at line 4 and I'm thinking to myself, hey, could I build W and T so that I could have a contradiction that looks like this? And the answer is yes I can because on 6 and 8 I have W and I have T. So I am inspired to put W and T together. That would be 6, 8, ampersand in. And the reason that I've done this is because now I can take 4 and 9 and put those together. So I would say W ampersand T ampersand tilde W ampersand T. Ah, kaboom, explosion, logical disaster, nonsense say it however you want to, what I have just shown is that if 7 was true, that would result in a contradiction. Therefore 7 can't be true and this becomes line 11. I see I got a little ahead of myself. I should have put a justification for 10. What is the justification for 10? It's going to be 4, 9, ampersand in, and then what's the justification for 11? It's 7 through 10 and the rule tilde in. And success! We have finished half of our proof. We just proved tilde 0 W. Great! Now we have another proof to do. We have to prove tilde G arrow D. Its main connective is an arrow. Well, which of these four things deals with arrows? Obviously it's arrow in, the one in the front. So we're going to make a box, occupies all the available space,
has a nice wavy end on it. Ah, it's hard to draw neatly with this uh, on a tablet like this. Okay, so here we're going to make a provisional assumption for arrow in. Now, we have tilde G arrow D at the bottom. If the arrow is the main connective, everything in front of it is P and everything is after it is Q. So we're not going to assume the opposite of anything. We're not doing tilde in or tilde out. Instead, tilde G goes to the top. And what goes to the bottom? D. That's arrow in. Quite simple. We've now got the box set up and we're ready to go back up to the top and see what we can do. Of course, there are some lines that are off limits to us right now. What is that? It's 7 through 10. Remember, a box is kind of like an imaginary world, and we're no longer in this imaginary world. So let's put an X through it to make sure that we don't use it. Another useful thing to do is sometimes just to go back and check off all the lines that you've worked on to make sure that we've actually, so that we really focus our attention. We worked on 1 and 2, and we've checked those off. We've worked on 3 and 7, so let's put little checks in front of those. Got it. 6 and 8. Yep, yeah, okay. 4 and 9. And also 7 through 10, that whole box. And so notice if we check that off, we see that we have D up here, and we've got tilde 0, W. Well, in fact, it hadn't, it's been a while since I did this proof. I had forgotten how easy this last box was going to be. But now that I've checked those things off, it becomes immediately apparent to me all I need to do to finish this box is to bring this D down to the bottom. This is an opportunity to use our repetition rule. So all we're going to do is say 5 repetition and we're done. There are other ways to have done this. In fact, in my head, what was going to happen here was that we were going to be stuck at the top and that we would have to go down to the bottom and say, hey, this is just a capital D. What rule would you do if you're stuck at the top and you have a D at the bottom? Well, that's when you would use tilde out. Strictly speaking, P means any formula whatsoever. So you can actually use tilde out to prove anything, as we'll see later in the semester. But for our purposes, you should, our purposes right now, you should only use tilde out when you have a single capital letter at the bottom. In this particular case, we didn't need it. But let me point out that we could have done this. We could have said, well, I'm stuck at the top with D at the bottom. I'm going to assume tilde D and try to get to a contradiction. And notice, we would have a contradiction immediately because we had the D at the top. We could have then inserted D and tilde D, and we'd be done. So here's an alternative way to finish this proof if we hadn't wanted to use repetition. Since we did use repetition, this is simple. All we say is, OK, I showed you that if you gave me tilde G, I could get to D. Therefore, I proved if tilde G, then D. And this would be 12, 13, arrow in, and then line 15. What is 15 going to be? Well, remember, it has an ampersand as its main connective. And we penciled in 11 and 14 for two lines for ampersand. Now that those two lines exist, we're just going to put them together. 11, 14, and the name of the rule, ampersand in. And that is it. We are done. Good luck with the studying.